Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today on LGBTQI plus in STEM day. Um, this day is very important for us in our field and is aimed to raise awareness uh, so that all of us can bring our whole selves to work. Um, to celebrate this day, we asked, um, as the Graduate Student Association, we asked Josh if he would like to give a talk. Um, and we were thrilled that he was very keen to do this. Um, so Josh is currently a postdoc in Rebecca Taylor's group um, in the LMB, and he was priv previously a PhD student um, and also part of the Graduate Student Association. Uh, he has previously hosted various events on LGBTQI plus STEM Day. Um, I'm very happy that he prepared this presentation for all of us. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, drop them in the chat and um, Josh can answer them afterwards. Um, I'm going to spotlight you now, Chris. Thank you. Fab. Right, I'll get started. Thanks for that, Chris. So as Chris says, my name is Josh Newman. Um, I use he, him pronouns. And today I'm really excited to be able to give you it's a queer history of science. So I'll start by giving you a bit of a background about what LGBT STEM Day is about. It's the third time this has happened. Uh, so it's a relatively new initiative. Um, and it says pretty much what this is on the tin, but I'll give you a bit more insight into that. And then the talk will be split up into three sections with a slightly Christmassy theme, I guess, a bit early, but, I, but it's there. Um, so I'll have the ghost of um, LGBT STEM past, and I'll spotlight a couple of um, stories of LGBTQ figures from science in history um, who have had some pretty interesting and quirky lives. And then uh, I'll move on to LGBTQ, ghosts of LGBTQ STEM present and talk a little bit about the challenges that we still face in STEM around LGBTQ voices and, and marginalized groups as well. And then finally, um, I'll focus a little bit about what we as individuals, as an institution, and as a scientific field can be thinking about when we move forward and to sort of try and accommodate LGBTQ voices in STEM a little bit more. So first things first, LGBTQ STEM Day, oh, there we go, um, was established back in 2018. So as I said, it's the third time this has happened. Um, and it used to be on the 5th of July. Uh, this year it's moved in honor of this guy, Frank Kameny, who was an American um, gay rights activist. But that wasn't always the case. He started his life as an astronomer for the US Army and then was dismissed because they found out he was gay. Don't ask, don't tell. Um, and he actually appealed this decision to um, the US courts. He unfortunately failed. Um, it was 19, sort of 1960. So um, we hadn't really progressed beyond, um, progressed towards LGBTQ rights at work, but he failed in that, that appeal, unfortunately. However, it was the first time uh, a case of civil rights was brought before a US court on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, and that court case was on the 18th of November, 1960. And this year is the 60th anniversary of that. And as such, um, it's the 18th of November has become LGBT STEM Day, at least in 2020. And what is the purpose of LGBT STEM Day? Well, as it says here, the aim is to raise the profile of LGBT individuals in STEM fields, and to really give um, a voice to people who, who haven't normally had a voice in STEM. Um, there are, there's a huge underrepresentation of LGBTQ figures in, in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Uh, and by raising their profile, giving them a spotlight, and giving them a chance to showcase their work and showcase their authentic selves, it's hoped that moving forward, more diverse um, hiring protocols, more diverse. Um, range of staff can be brought on board to really increase the representation of LGBTQ individuals in our um, scientific field. So that's a bit of history of LGBT STEM. There's a link at the end um, to Pride in STEM, which is the organization that uh, runs LGBT uh, STEM Day. And there's loads more information on there about the history of what they do and ways to get involved. There's also other organizations they partner with to really champion those voices. So I urge you to check out that website later on. So now I'm gonna move on to um, the ghosts of LGBTQ plus STEM past. Now, as a diligent scientist, my first port of call when I was researching for this talk was Wikipedia. Um, and I went onto the notable LGBT scientist page, which is a page that exists uh, and found 
only 70 names throughout the whole of history of scientists who are, who are thought to be or identify as um, LGBTQ that are in STEM. Now, I have to say I was quite disappointed at first to see that there are only 70 names, but there are obviously cultural and societal reasons why that might be the case. It's really pleasing to see that lots of the names on those lists are modern day names, people who are still working now. Um, and that sort of shows that the tide is changing. Um, but hopefully in the next decade or so, we start that, that list starts to expand slightly more. So I'm gonna give you um, an insight into four different lives um, from around the 1800s uh, that I think are quite exciting, but also uh, are thought to be LGBTQ individuals as well. So we'll start with this lady here, Sophia Jex Blake, who was a doctor um, in the sort of 1800s, the early 1900s. Now she was born in a time when women didn't have any many rights in general. She uh, was born to a quite well-off family who were from Hastings. She was able to get a private school, so she was quite privileged in that sense. But she wasn't able to pursue higher education. That wasn't for women. Women weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to become doctors, um, so on and so forth. Sophia rightly thought that this was very unfair. And she um, advocated strongly that uh, women should be able to be um, trained medically. And she wrote a series of essays um, that Josephine Butler uh, published about uh, medicine as a career choice for women, where she advocated for a level playing field. And she said that, um, I've got a quote here, that a fair field and no favour was the best way to prove that women were, were as in, uh, are intellectual um, counterparts to men. There was no intellectual inferi inferiority of women to men and that a woman could do exactly what a man could do as well. And the best way to prove that was to admit her into university and prove that she could do an exam um, just as well as a man could. And she applied to the University of Edinburgh Medical School um, and was rejected on the basis that they couldn't cater for just one woman alone. So she came up with this, I guess, bizarre um, campaigning tool and um, submitted an advert to the Scotsman newspaper asking other women to come forward and apply to medicine alongside her. And her and six other women did exactly that and they became known as the Edinburgh Seven. And the Edinburgh Seven were a group of seven women who applied to Edinburgh University and were the first seven women in the whole of the, uh, of the United Kingdom to be matriculated into university. Now this wasn't without um, issue. There was a huge amount of hostility aimed at these women. Um, there, were, there was mud thrown at them, there, was fire, there were fireworks attached to their front doors. Uh, they were hounded day and night. And it, and it came to um, a climax, I guess, when uh, there was an, they were going to an anatomy exam and they were, there was a riot outside. 200 people protesting the fact that they wanted to sit an anatomy exam. Something that we take for granted now that those rights were afforded to all of us, um, these women weren't allowed to. This led to their degrees being revoked and they weren't allowed to hold the title of doctor. But Sophia went ahead and pursued her medical career anyway. Um, she went over to um, Bern and did another medical degree there where her degree was conferred to her. And she established the London School of Medicine for Women, the Edinburgh School of Medicine for Women, um, and was chronically successful in those pursuits and really advocated for um, increased representation of women in medicine. She also had a long-term life partner um, called Dr. Margaret Todd, and they lived together um, throughout her life and they retired together. Um, and from what I've read about their relationship, it, they were devoted to one another. Dr. Margaret Todd was also a, a Scottish doctor and she, you might recognize her name because she was the woman who coined the term isotope. So if you're ever working with an isotope, um, think of uh, Dr. Margaret Todd and Sophia Jex Blake because they're the couple that uh, where this term originates from. Unfortunately, um, well, not unfortunately, she died very, uh, at 71 um, and Margaret Todd wrote a beautiful book about um, Sophia's advocacy for women in science. Um, and that was the first case of a really inspiring LGBTQ story from history that I found. I'm gonna move on to somebody who was born in very different circumstances now. And that is George Washington Carver, who is um, an American who was born into slavery. 
in the 1860s. We don't know his original, his exact birth date, and neither did he. Um, but he was born in slavery to a guy called Moses Carvin. And within, a within the first week of his life, was kidnapped and taken away by Arkansas slave traders, but was eventually negotiated back to the family of the Carvers. And um, when the slave trade was abolished, when he was still quite young, um, the Carver family basically adopted him as their child and raised him as one of their own. But because um, of racism in the US at the time, uh, he wasn't able to go to a, a public school, so had to travel to a, a different city to a, a school for, for black children. But he fought hard and he progressed through and eventually became the first, I guess, plant scientist, uh, black plant scientist in the Iowa uh, State University. From here, he, became, he becomes quite famous. He um, comes up with different ways of rotating crops, specifically uh, cotton, and he suggests that you um, intersperse the, the cotton plant with uh, sweet potato and peanuts and things like that. And he gets the attention of the US administration. And Teddy Roosevelt is a big fan of George Washington Carver. Uh, and he gets this reputation for coming up with weird and wacky ways of using peanuts, which seems like a very bizarre uh, origin of, of notability. But that is his, and he became a very public figure who advocated um, for different inventions. Um, was called the, the Black Leonardo, and he was a bisexual man. Um, he had relationships with, with women, and he had relationships with, with men. And one in particular, Austin Curtis, was, was his research partner, and they did science together, and um, they, they spent, particularly the, the later years of his life, they spent um, to notice one another as well until he unfortunately um, fell down some stairs and died. Um, but he left his, his estate um, partially to, to Austin, um, which is, I guess, a lovely tale if you, if you forget about the, the stairs. Um, I'm going to move on to this bizarre chap now, Franz Nupkosa von Felso Silvas. I'm sorry if I've absolutely brutalised that name. Um, this guy uh, was a baron. He was from Transylvania, which at the time was in the Kingdom of Hungary. And he had a very, very sort of well-off, privileged life. He was able to um, go to the University of Vienna where he studied geology and then did his PhD in geology where he studied, he ge geologically mapped his family's estate. Uh, so, so it's all right if you have a, a whole load of land that you can survey, um, but he was really interested in, in in geology and actually became the, the, one of the founders of um, paleobiology, where you ascribe uh, I guess physio physi physiology and biological relevance to fossils and bones and things. Now he um, hired a secretary called um, Bajazid Doda, I'm terrible with names today, um, and they started a, a romantic relationship from when they were both quite young. And that relationship lasted throughout their entire lives. In fact, Franz named a species of turtle after um, Doda because um, the shape of the shell reminded Franz of um, Doda's backside. So that's a very romantic sentiment, I'm sure. So um, Franz was also very interested in the, in, in, in the Albanian state. And at the time, Albania didn't have independence and was fighting with the Turks a lot. And he learned Albanian, he went to Albania a huge amount. Um, him and Doda would, would go together uh, and he helped supply them with weapons. He, he was obviously from a well-off family. Um, he supplied them with weapons and tactics and knew who he needed to know in the Albanian state. Eventually when Albania became independent, he actually offered to be their king, um, something that they, they, they declined. Um, so instead in World War One, he went off and became a spy and after that ended, was able to take up a post as the head of the Hungarian Geological um, Museum. Unfortunately, he fell ill um, and he, him and Doda committed a, a, a dual suicide. Um, but they had this enduring love that lasted throughout their lives and had very quirky and bizarre lives at the same time. Now, the last person I want to spotlight and highlight for you today 
is this gentleman, Alan Hart, who was one of the first cases um, of a transgender man in the US being documented and having surgery. So Alan grew up pretty much identifying as male um, from his birth um, and his parents were very happy with accommodating that um, until he had to go to school and was forced to, uh, to um, come across as, as female. However, um, despite this, he, he championed, um, um, I guess, at the time, um, non-gender conforming rights um, and fought hard to be able to go to medical school, which he did. And then when his medical license was conferred to him, it was, it was in his, what we call dead name. So the name that um, Alan had when um, he was given at birth, but it's since changed to Alan. This frustrated out Alan hugely because um, it meant he couldn't get work while presenting as a man because the license was in a, was in a female name. Um, so eventually he sought psychiatric help um, and was able to go through a series of counselling to the point where they were, where the medical professional were convinced that he was um, actually identifying as male. Uh, and he was able to undergo the first hysterectomy for gender reassignment purposes in the US, the first ever documented case. And he was able to properly legally change his name and his, his gender identity and went on to get married, start his own practices. Um, but unfortunately, though, when it was, it, was, it was ousted that he was in fact a transgender man, he was ousted from town, um, hounded out of town by, by the local people and his, his marriage broke down. So he decided that the best way to deal with that was to go and do more studying, do a postgraduate degree and run away from his problems, which I'm sure many of us can empathize with. Um, and he went and he studied radiology and eventually became a champion of, uh, well, one of the first people to advocate for using x-rays to image tuberculosis. And this was hugely um, revolutionary in the field of TB at the time and really helped to um, save millions of lives. Um, so they're the four lives that I wanted to spotlight briefly before we move on to the next part of the talk. And I thought they were really interesting. They're people that I've not particularly heard of before. Um, they're names that aren't commonplace, but they had such interesting, rich and fulfilled lives. Um, and it really just goes to show that there's so much depth to LGBTQ scientists beyond just an identity, but the fact that they have that identity as well. Um, and are still able to push through the boundaries that they face is pretty incredible. So now I'm gonna move on to ghosts of LGBTQ STEM present because there are many of them. Um, and here are just a few stats that I've put together about the challenges that LGBTQ individuals face in STEM. So th th this is all collated from um, some reports from the past decade that show LGBTQ people are about 20% less represented in STEM fields than they should be. And when you look at male undergraduates from sexual minorities, that, that is from across the different um, areas of the spectrum, they're less likely to stay in STEM than straight counterparts. As well as that, 69% of sexual minority STEM faculty members report feeling uncomfortable in their departments. Now, these are obviously aren't great stats and there are things that we must try and do to work through them. But the first thing we have to do is try to identify the cause of some of these problems. Um, so one of these is the fact that there is lack of LGBTQ role models in higher positions. What you find as you go further through academia and industry um, and STEM as a whole is that the further up you get, the more um, straight it gets, the more cis it gets, and the more male it tends to get, and the more white. Um, and as such, you kind of reach um, a barricade where it's hard to push through because as somebody who is an LGBTQ um, identifying person, when you look for somebody who represents you in the higher echelons of power, you can't see that. So subconsciously or consciously, in the back of your mind, your head is saying, this isn't for you, this, this job isn't for you, you're not welcome here. Um, perhaps that isn't the case in, in, in many different places, but it's, it's the impression that that gives off. And obviously there are temporal factors there. Um, as I said, there's been a cultural shift in the past few decades. And I'm glad to see that at the LMB and wider, 
you're seeing greater representation of particularly new faculty members coming in, some of whom um, identify as LGBTQ. And having those people in those roles and being open and honest about who they are um, is, is a great way of championing a new generation of LGBTQ voices in STEM. Another issue faced for a number of reasons is the internationality of research. And I'm going to explain that in more depth now. So obviously one of the wonderful things about working in science is that we meet people from across the world. I think it's one of the best um, aspects of being in a scientific field is that we, we are able to work with um, and work hard with people from, from all walks of life. Um, but it sometimes means that when you meet people from different cultures, you can hide yourself a little bit more because it, it, it's, you're chronically unsure about whether um, what their views on, on LGBTQ rights are, whether they would um, have a negative opinion of you if you, if you disclose information to them um, and things like that. So whilst internationality of research is, is one of the sort of highlights of being in, in a scientific field, it also presents challenges to LGBTQ individuals um, about being open at work. And there are things that obviously we can work through um, about, and, and the way to do that is about having those conversations and being open and having an open and accepting workplace. The other side of the international, internationality of research um, is travel and work. So obviously, and the other, the other perk of being in a scientific field is that you get to travel to, the, to places to, uh, for postdocs, for positions, um, for, for conferences and things like that. But sometimes, especially when you're not from an LGBTQ background, you don't realise that that presents a challenge for some people. To put it into a, a more um, understandable context, when I go on holiday and choose a country abroad, uh, one of the first things that I have to do is check their, right, their record and rights on um, LG, for LGBTQ people. And if that record is bad, I won't be able to go on holiday there. I won't feel comfortable going on holiday there. And that's, thing, that's something that straight cis people don't think about when they go on holiday. Maybe they just check whether it's safe uh, in general. But um, there's a whole other um, sort of factor of things that come in for LGBTQ people. In terms of STEM, this was brought home to me recently when I think the Society for Neuroscience ran a, um, well, are setting their, their neuroscience conference in Poland, which at the minute has a terrible um, record for, on LGBTQ rights and is actively clamping down with um, no LGBTQ zones. And that can present huge challenges for an LGBTQ researcher because on one hand, they want to go to conferences and showcase their research and network and try and progress their career. But if they, if they don't feel safe in the country the way that's being hosted, they can't do that. So that automatically puts them a sort of step back from their straight cis counterparts because, because they can't access the same opportunities as those researchers. The same sort of thing can be extended to um, working in other countries. Um, yeah. And finally, um, we might be working in STEM, uh, we might, and lots of us working in academia, but we still face the same challenges that people in workplaces across the country and across the world face. We have to come out to people every single day. And the process of coming out all the time is exhausting. Um, there's a whole host of mental um, arithmetic going on, like, can I tell this person? If I tell that person, will they tell that person? Um, if I tell this person, will it affect my career? Um, and then also day-to-day -day discrimination. I like to think we work, we work in a very open, tolerant um, institute in science. In general, I often find at heart can be um, open and accepting. In practice, sometimes maybe not. Um, even small day-to-day -day things that we, I guess we call a microaggression. So microaggressions are things that people might say an off comment um, or a small little quip that, that people probably wouldn't think about normally. But if you are from a marginalized background, that might play on your mind, especially if you're getting small quips like that all the time. Um, so these are things that people across workplaces face day-to-day. Uh,
And why is it important to overcome these? Just in case you haven't figured out already, it's really important that people can be their authentic selves at work because it allows us to work and flourish and achieve our potentials. I wanna be able to come into work on a Monday and talk openly about my boyfriend or what we did at the weekend or, um, and being able to do that means that you don't have that level of um, what, what can I talk about now? What can I not talk about now? That brings me on to the second point of not having to hide an important part of your life. And that allows you to, work, to focus on other things. If you're stressing about um, being outed, about if you're being discriminated against and you're stressing about um, how you're being treated at work, you can't focus on the work that you're doing. And all of us are passionate about uh, the topic that we're researching, but if you can't focus on that, it's not gonna progress in the way that you'd like. And that's through fault that it's not your own. And finally, having a more diverse scientific workforce expands and enhances our scientific thinking. It's really exciting to be in a place, as I say, that's so international, but also has such a broad range of voices of people from different backgrounds. Um, and that allows us to think in different ways and come up with new ideas. And if we encourage that, um, then hopefully those ideas will be more exciting, more novel and um, better on the whole. So LGBTQ people have always existed in STEM. Um, there might only be 70 notable names on that Wikipedia page, but they've always existed in STEM, whether we've known it or not. It's just visibility and career progression that is lacking. So what can we do going forward? So now I'm going to move on to the ghosts of LGBTQ STEM future. And try and, this is of course not, not the, an exhaustive list of things that we should be doing as individuals and as an institute, but it is um, the start of a conversation. And as long as we continue that conversation, that's the important thing. Ghosts of LGBTQ STEM future. So what can we practically do as individuals to try and improve LGBTQ representation in STEM subjects? The first is to use pronouns in communications. This is so basic that we, that we can all do it really easily. It doesn't take anything away from us. So communications can be on your emails, in your email signature. It can be on your Twitter. In my bio, I've got it on there. Um, it can be, for example, at the start of a talk like I've just done here. You don't even have to say it. You just have to put it on there. Why is it important that we all put pronouns in our communications? Well, because that normalises the use of pronouns. If we normalise the use of pronouns, it means that people who use pronouns aren't automatically outing themselves. Trans and gender non-conforming people um, use pronouns so that they're not misgendered. But it is unfair on them to expect them to do that and out themselves in the process if they don't feel comfortable doing that. So we normalise it so we all do those, that we all include pronouns, it means it's not an automatic coming out. And also just sort of gives off the impression that we are an accepting um, and understanding workforce. I know that when I see people including pronouns, in my head I'm like, oh, that's a progressive place to work. They, have, <clears throat> they are pro-LGBTQ rights. Um, that's somebody I'd li I like to work with and I won't feel um, like I'm being inauthentic when I work with them and hiding part of myself. So including pronouns and communications is, is a good start. When it's safe and comfortable, be open about who you are. And this is more to people who are watching this that identify as LGBTQ. And it is in, in no way to encourage you to come out if you don't feel comfortable with it. Coming out is a, is a very difficult process, especially um, at work. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, you shouldn't. But I really encourage you that if you are comfortable and open in your personal life to, to consider being that comfortable and open um, in your work life as well. For a number of reasons. It, it, having that visibility in a, in a STEM workplace allows other people who may be struggling with their identity to see that there is support, support there, maybe from people in their community. But the fact that you're able to continue working uh, and being successful and doing the science gives off this, this huge um, impression that the workplace to be working are inclusive. And also when, when, when you're open at work about who you are and progress through your career, hopefully we then start to get role models in positions of higher power um, and we can bring up a new fledgling generation of, of LGBTQ scientists who don't feel put off by the lack of role models in higher positions. 
And finally, on the individual front, don't be afraid to get things wrong. Um, it is okay to make a mistake. Like, it's absolutely fine. It's like, if you, if you actually misgender somebody, use the wrong term. Um, okay, you've made a mistake. Just apologise and try and learn from it. People aren't trying to attack you for getting something wrong. Because we all do it. I do it. Um, terms change. There's lots of terminology that, if you're not from those communities, might seem quite alien to you. But don't be afraid to ask a question if you're unsure. For example, if you're if you're not sure um, what some of your pronouns are, maybe be, maybe at all. I use the pronouns he him. What about you? Um, and then it's non-confrontational things like that. And also, if you get something wrong, just accept it and try and um, learn from it um, going forward. And that's the best thing you can do as an individual. As allies, so this is more um, focused on people who are not LGBTQ but want to try and help the cause as much as possible, which I hope many, many people at Ally and Shoot do. The first thing you can do is try and attend events like this. Obviously, I'm preaching to the choir right now if you're watching this. Um, but allyship is so important because you want to be able to access events once again without outing yourself necessarily. You want to be able to see what support is there. Um, and maybe if you're struggling with, with um, your gender or sexuality, <clears throat> being able to come to an event without automatically people being like, you must be gay, you must be bisexual, you must be trans. Um, it's really useful for you to sort of explore that in a safe and comfortable environment. It also lets um, institutions know that there is a, there is a whole um, host of support for these kind of movements and for these kind of events and allows them um, to hopefully continue in the future. Speak out if you see discrimination. Um, I mean, this is an obvious point, but it is one that I think many of us shy away from because um, it is difficult. If you see somebody, something happening at work and you think it's unfair, people from marginalized backgrounds might not have the, um, the power dynamic in that situation to speak out for themselves. So if you genuinely think that something is happening that is unfair or discriminatory, speak out and support your LGBTQ and other marginalized group colleagues. Um, and that will go a long way. And finally, if you think your, your uh, colleague might be, might identify as LGBTQ, let them come out in their own time. There's no point trying to shove them out of the closet. Um, it's not fair on them um, and your relationship with them will be better for it if you don't force them to come out. Just be there and support them when they need it. What can we do as institutions? Firstly, we can fund and promote inclusivity initiatives. So that includes training and training for people who work in, in, in positions of power, so that's PIs, that's people who work in human resources, that's people who work in um, as heads of departments, things like that. Um, so that people are aware of diversity needs um, and will promote them in their hiring processes and in their leadership skills. And then networking events as well. I appreciate things are quite difficult in the COVID age, but hopefully going forward, that won't be so much of an issue. Um, but if you have networking events, people can be more at ease at work. So they can see that they're represented amongst their colleagues. And that goes a huge way. Um, have open communication with minority and marginalised communities. Um, so I think going forward, it's really important to invest in diversity, equality and inclusion committees. Um, that take a, an independent look at the policies and procedures that are in place for an institute and identify where there might be issues and where there can be improvements. Um, but it's, the important thing about these kind of committees is that a mix of allies um, and people from these marginalised communities are involved. The onus shouldn't always be on those people who are marginalised to push for these movements. Cis straight white people should be pushing for them as well um, because they are on the whole beneficial for us all. They make our workplaces more uh, welcoming and accepting of all people and that's what we should all want. So we should all be championing these kind of causes. And have um, robust anti-discrimination policies and procedures in places. I think particularly in academia, you forget that, um, it's easy to forget that we have an HR department. It functions like a, a normal place of work, particularly if you are um, a student, a PhD student, a postgraduate student. I think it's easy to forget that if you need to access 
um, that, that kind of support it exists. Um, and we should be making sure that, that that information is readily available for those that need it um, and that it's accessible for them. And finally, um, as, an, as a scientific field, what can we do? The first thing is we can do is, is we can hold um, science accountable and call out bad faith science revolving around marginalised communities. This paper caused a lot of controversy a few months ago um, because it was finally proven that men can be bisexual uh, which I think is probably in bad taste, to put it mildly. Um, so holding science accountable and calling out over, um, calling out science like this that is, is over scrutinizing people's identity in a way that is harmful to those communities um, and making sure that we can be as inclusive when we think about scientific research as possible. Second thing is to introduce diversity practices into scientific forums. So whether this is in terms of um, grant applications, funding applications, job applications, there's often a diversity statement in there that you can fill in optionally, uh, but make sure that those are there and that there are criteria um, for assessing LGBTQ people um, and sort of implementing those um, diversity um, practices into your actual hiring processes, processes. and also thinking about conferences and um, outreach events, how can you make them as inclusive as possible for a whole host of marginalised communities. And finally, um, this is more specific, but there's been a big push recently to try and encourage journals to have robust name change protocols in place. So um, for people who are gender non-conforming, who choose to change their name, um, it could be a huge barrier to scientific progression because a lot of their old published work will be in their dead name, so the name they used previously. Not only can that be quite triggering for those people to be faced with that dead name constantly, it also hampers their progress. Some um, journals have started to take this on board and I've seen in the past few months that I've seen one or two that have come up with uh, easy ways to implement those changes. Um, but if, if you um, end up being an editor, working for journals, or you're able to lobby them in some kind of way, that is a good place to start. So I'm going to sort of end on how do we make this progress sustainable? So allies and members of the LGBT community must work together. And I've touched on this before. Um, it shouldn't just be people from these communities that drive these things forward. We have to work together because it is in the benefit of us all, but also LGBTQ people and marginalised people already have barriers to making progress there. They don't need to have another weight of organising the, the whole of a diversity a workshop on top of um, the other issues that they face. So we need to work together. Progress must take an intersectional approach. So intersectional means covering a range of marginalised um, voices. That includes um, race, sexuality, gender, things like that and disability. Um, why is that important? Studies have shown that when you, that the, in, well, in the past, I guess, few decades, there's been a huge push for an increased representation of, representation of women in science. And that has had a knock-on effect that you've actually, the places that have more women in science have more LGBTQ voices um, staff as well. Um, so if we take an intersectional approach to some of these um, issues with diversity, hopefully we can actually solve a lot of them at the same time. So doing, doing bits and pieces for all of these different um, marginalised groups should benefit many of them at the same time, hopefully. And finally, diversity movements that we, we push for should have discernible targets and hallmarks of, of progress and success. This is important because it means when those targets aren't met, we can hold institutions accountable and ask them why they haven't been met. And when you have clearly defined targets, um, then it's, it, it's very abundant when, um, when, deaf, when LGBTQ and marginalised voices have failed in that, in that sense. Um, so when we, when we push for, for policies and procedures, we should make sure that there's an end goal that we can tick um, or say, yes, we've done that, or we haven't done that. And then we can go and shout at the people that need to be shouted at if that if needs be. So that is um, pretty much the talk I want to give you. Um, we've seen what, uh, the, the very little representation there was in LGBTQ STEM 
historically, and we touched upon some four very interesting and exciting lives. We've looked at some of the issues that still exist in, in STEM fields, and then started a conversation about what we can do going forward. So in summary, we all have a role to play in improving representation of LGBTQ and other marginalized voices in STEM. We have to come together to try and um, tackle those issues, but we can do that as individuals in our day-to-day -day practice as well, by trying to be more accepting um, and adopting small things like pronouns, because um, it gives off a much um, greater signal than you think it might do. And finally, I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs barking, I'm at home. Uh, and finally, diversity in science allows us to achieve more exciting outcomes with a broader range of scientific thought. Um, and I stand by that, and I think that if we have a more diverse workforce, we will have more diverse and exciting scientific ideas. So finally, I just wanted to thank you all for listening. Uh, thank Chris particularly for helping me um, with this and the GSA uh, public engagement who've been advertising this and working with us to try and push forward some of these diversity um, things. And my supervisor, Rebecca Taylor as well, who has um, promoted a very open and inclusive lab environment. And finally, here is the um, link for the Pride in STEM that I was telling you about. That, that, that's the organisation that organises LGBT STEM Day. Um, there's, there's loads more information on there, along with events that are on today and over the next week, um, and uh, lots of other information that you can access there as well. I've also put my email address here, um, as well as that's my Twitter handle. If anybody wants to get in touch with me with questions that they don't feel comfortable sharing here, and they don't feel comfortable sharing maybe on, a, on the work email platform, message me on Twitter or, or message my email address. I'll be, I'll be very willing and happy to help. But on that note, I just wanted to thank you um, for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, if you have any questions um, and would like to speak, I can um, unmute you. Um, so if I, um, I will allow you to speak. Um, Right, yeah, I can see Eva's. So Eva asks, she was wondering, where do you think um, the filter or barrier that prevents LGBTQ plus students entering a scientific career in the first place? Um, how do you increase access to STEM? That's a really good question. So I think a lot of the barrier that is in place is, is probably very similar for other marginalised groups as well. It's um, lack of representation for a start. It's really hard to push forward in a career when you just don't see yourself represented in, in it. If you look at a career and it's all people that aren't you, you're not really gonna to want to engage with it as much. Um, as well as that, I think there was a lot of, um, from, a lot of the, if you, from a lot of the testimonies that I've listened to from other LGBTQ people, um, they feel that there's a lot of, I guess, toxic masculinity, because science and technology, engineering, maths are very male dominated, and that can put a lot of um, LGBTQ people off pursuing those kind of um, careers. Um, how can you increase STEM access to STEM? So I, I think that the best way to, to push for that is to um, try and increase that representation um, bit by bit. I think the way we do that is now as, as people who are, um, I guess many of us are starting careers in, in, in science, doing PhDs or starting postdocs or maybe a bit further on, um, is to try and be as open and inclusive as possible and to give off a signal that we are accepting of uh, people from a range of different backgrounds, of sexual orientations, of gender identities. And once it starts, I think once people see that there, there, there's, there's, there are people there that represent them, I think it would, it would be more reflective of, um, of, of a whole spectrum of LGBTQ people. I have answered your question. If there are any more questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I would also like to um, refer you to um, the bottom of the email that has been sent around. There are a lot of uh, resources and references there. Um, there's also a UKRI LGBTQI plus in STEM um, seminar series or this day that starts around two. So if you're interested, please have a look. Um, yeah, and thank you, Josh, really a lot for your talk. I really like the four portraits as well. And um, thank you everyone from, for joining us.
Um, and Liz has another question. Yes, uh, from a perspective, what communication actions do you think will help most? That's a great question. Um, so I actually thought earlier on this year, I mean, you also know this, but for everybody else listening, earlier on this year, um, the LMB used the progressive pride flag that has um, black pride and trans pride included in the, in the colours on the flag. Um, and the moment I saw that, it, it sent a signal to me. I was like, as an institute, there are people here that are very concerned about being as open and accommodating as possible to the point where they're trying to keep on top of sort of these kind of movements. And that kind of thing um, on, your, on social media is really important, but also um, promoting events like this, which you, you, you've been doing already, um, because people that are applying to work here, or applying to a PhD here, are going to be looking at social media. They're going to be looking at the website. Um, they're going to be looking at Twitter or whatever and trying to see whether it is an open and inclusive platform, an open and inclusive place of work. Um, so I think keep doing what you're doing, advertise what's going on. Um, and hopefully if we have more events like this, more training, more networking events, the fact that they're advertised and, um, and on those platforms um, would hopefully help. And there's also um, a direct question from Lisa, which she asked to ask in person. So I allowed her to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I wasn't able to phrase that while listening to you. That's why I just wanted to say it. Um, I think one problem that we maybe face with this um, well, working against discrimination of LGBTQ um, people is that a lot of people in science, I think, believe that it is no longer a big problem. I think these are people that know someone who's gay, that have someone who's gay in their labs maybe, and think, what's the problem? They are here. It doesn't seem to be an issue anymore. And I think it's very hard to reach these people. And I wonder what we can do to change that. And just as an example, looking at the participants in this talk, there's one group leader in here, um, which I think is very telling sign of what's the, um, yeah, what the issues are that we're still faced with at this very institute. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. And actually, having run, uh, Chris said at the start, last LGBTQ STEM day, which was when we could all meet and we could all um, have cake together. Um, it was an opportunity to try and bring people together from every um, part of the LMB. Um, but one group leader came, and that was my group leader, um, which I'm sure she would have anyway, but I think she probably came because I was, I was organising it. Um, we need engagement from higher up as well. So, I, but it's really hard to get across to people that don't engage in this, that, that it's still an issue. And the only answer I can really think of is to shout a bit louder and be like, these are issues that we are facing and you need to take them seriously. Which is why I think having diversity um, committees is important because it says that the Institute is taking these, pro these problems seriously and that hopefully filters down from the top. It's really hard to, get a message forward when you're pushing it from the ground up. But if it's filtering down from the top, um, then hopefully that should be able to help. So Dina said, should we bring this up during lab meetings, talk to PIs about these horrible papers, for example? I mean, that's something you could do. I think it depends very much on the lab dynamics you have. Um, but days like this or events like this are really good starting points to trigger a conversation about how, I mean, I guess labs work very, um, autonomously so how can you as a lab be more inclusive and, and open um so those conversations are important and that's a great forum to be able to do that maybe in a more relaxed informal lab meeting yes and then also Marianne Lancaster has a question yeah hi here I'll, I'll uh, start my video too so you can see me can you hear me yeah yeah so my I'm wondering if um if the LGBTQ community in particular has maybe even a harder time of it because it's it's hidden so unlike you know race or or you know gender well or you know <laughs> female versus male let's say um which are visible you know lgbtq is hidden so i'm just wondering if what i'm not sure exactly sort of how to address that and i guess you know you talked about if you feel comfortable, you know, being more more um, expressive about it, I guess, or being more open about who you are. But yeah, I just wonder if there's something we can do to, to help that along a little bit. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. 
and I think um, from reading some of the testimonials that I've seen from uh, from people further on in their careers that have done more um, science things in general, um, some of the issues with diversity, for example, diversity uh, statements in funding applications, etc., often neglect LGBTQ voices because, as you say, it's it's not obvious just by necessarily looking at somebody <laughs> where, where on the spectrum they fall. Um, but what can we do? That is, 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 is the, I guess, the question that we're trying to answer. And I don't think I have an exact answer for you, unfortunately, but I think the best way um, that we could do it is just by ourselves as people who are open or comfortable or, um, or allies is just by being open and having conversations and giving across a welcoming environment. There are obviously things that we can do as an institute and um, I don't have the answers to that. There are things that committees should be talking about. Yeah, I, can, I mean, I guess, so just to follow, I guess what I would, I mean, because it's hidden, it seems like it needs even more so, it needs people from the Institute group leader level to show that they are open and allies and, you know, supportive. That's exactly it. And I think often um, PRs can forget the influence they, that they can really have on people that are uh, uh, sort of up and coming. And having allies that are PIs or people who identify as LGBTQ as PIs being open and saying, we accept people like you um, and we welcome you and um, we respect you has carries so much weight and probably a lot more weight than you realize it does. Um, and that's, I think, one step in the right direction that we can do. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a more yeah. eloquent answer than that at the minute. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I think um, what you did at the beginning of the presentation, having your pronouns there is something that's maybe not that common. And I think I actually really appreciated that. I think it marks a conversation as well. It's like a small thing, but also yeah. helps in that direction. Yeah, I think also, as I said in the talk, when I, when I see people using their pronouns, I automatically think this, this is somebody that is, is accepting of um, LGBTQ people. And I automatically feel more comfortable in that setting straight away. Um, and it's such a small thing to be able to do, um, but it goes a, a long way. And there were more questions um, and suggestions. Um, so Girish asked, uh, would it help to have a forum or panel or some event during LMB induction? So all attended as in mandatory and thank you thank you for the talk yeah that's interesting yeah because i guess we have um talked about health and safety about general introductions to the institute um maybe having a part where um we're able to show what sport is on offer etc and frame it in that sense um we'll, we'll give off um sort of a positive um pro uh, inclusion message that can really go a long way. Definitely something that we could think about and lobby for. Um, yeah, as, yeah, absolutely. I think then, um, if there are no further, did I? Yeah, if there are no further questions, I think um, we can all have a, a coffee before the UKRI seminar series start. And um, thank you everyone for attending, and thank you, Josh, for this talk. It was I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me.